Hi, and welcome to episode six of the Fight for the Future live stream. Uh, today, we're joined by Krish Mohan, who is a comedian and podcaster. Um, and the topic of discussion today is platform censorship, and maybe more specifically, YouTube censorship. Um, but I guess I can just kick things off um, with my first question, which is, uh, so Krish, you have been experienced, you, you're a content creator on YouTube, you have a number of podcasts, you have your YouTube channel, you're very frequently creating new content for YouTube. And it's clear to me just going over some of your social media and listening to a few episodes of your podcast that you have had to deal with like a huge influx of censorship over the years across platforms, but it seems particularly focused on censorship within YouTube. Could you maybe yeah. describe to me a little bit of your experiences, how you've been censored, the, the ways that they, that they wield this censorship power, and just describe a little bit of what you've been going through on the platform. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Um, it, it's, it's been <laughs> ongoing for a, a really long time. Like I've had this YouTube channel since I was in college and I primarily, the only reason I started it was to share like stand up clips. Mm -hmm. Uh, but once I started doing this more full time, I wanted to like, I just wanted to create weekly content, uh, like, a like, like the daily show kind of, uh, but for the internet, uh, cause I don't have a huge budget and everything. So I started doing like more political commentary, um, which, which then I started seeing like an influx of subscribers because the more content you create, the more you're kind of recommended and, and you move up the, the, you know, the YouTube ranks and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but once I started like getting more subscribers and this is back in like 2013, 2014, uh, I started noticing it started to taper off and regardless of how much I shared, it didn't really matter. Like the subscriber count wouldn't really go up past a certain point. Um, and there, and and I noticed that that kind of happened more often than not. So, like when I started touring with Lee Camp, a lot of his followers would find my work and they would subscribe to my channel, which is awesome. But then all of a sudden that would stop too. And then when it would naturally start growing again, like in 2019, when I was talking a lot more about the election and you know what was going on with Tulsi Gabbard and Bernie Sanders and how the Democratic Party wasn't treating them fairly. I was starting to see another big influx in subscriber count. And then all of a sudden it would just kind of disappear. Like it's one thing mm -hmm. if it was a gradual increase and then a gradual decrease, but it was like, I would in a, in a span of a month, I would go from, you know, 350 to 450 subscribers. And it was like, awesome. People are finding my channel They're They're, they're sharing my channel and so on and so forth. But then all of a sudden it's like at the end of that month, there is a this huge significant decline uh and that happened to me again because in january once i started doing more live streams more people were finding my channel and then i was starting to get more subscribers uh, but this time what they did was uh they deleted two of my videos and gave me a strike on my channel so i couldn't stream upload or post any content for a week what, what for and they well they said that it was it was for spam and deceptive practices uh, specifically dealing with the election. So after January 6th, when we had the whole stop the steal, uh, capital riot, insurrection, uh, whatever you want to call it, when, when that sort of happened, we, we, a lot of content creators, especially on the left, really started noticing like, well, this is going to have some pretty major consequences for us. Uh, for anybody, you know, they're they're going to kind of use this as an opportunity to start censoring voices that don't really side with the mainstream. So uh, initially at the end of January, it was like Ron Placone's uh, page, Graham Elwood, Lee Camp's page, Nico House, all these like really a lot of bigger YouTube channels just got completely demonetized, which means they don't get any ad revenue. They can't get super chats. Uh, they can't take any donations directly, you know, uh, on their YouTube channels and stuff. So people that were earning an income, creating content, paying their bills from these donations, from these ad revenues, were no longer able to do that. So they were kind of financially trying to censor people. And are you saying uh, this is not on a per video basis, but channel wide, their channel demonetization was disabled? Yeah, globally. Completely. C completely yep <laughs> and like, was this around a time that they were covering the like ele like the election or what, what 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 kind of content were they making when this happened 
Yeah, it was it was kind of different all around. Um, I know for for Graham, um, he talked about uh, the JFK assassination. That was the last video that he had put up. Um, there, I I think him and Lee Camp were discussing a book about the JFK assassination mm-hmm. and like what the book revealed and stuff. And then literally the day after that video goes up, his channel was completely demonetized. Uh, I'm not sure what the last video Nico put up. Or, or Ron put up was they didn't really talk about it as much as Graham did because they were all trying to figure out what the hell just happened uh, so right after that maybe two weeks later I had something strange happen to me where a live stream that I put up in the middle of January uh, talking about Trump's acquittal mm-hmm. and, uh, and and a Time Magazine article that had come out which specifically says that uh, the the Democratic Party had a conspiracy to get Joe Biden elected. Like those are the words in the article, and I was just reading the article that they had printed. Uh, it claimed that uh, what I was doing was deceptive practices. Like I was saying, oh, Joe Biden's not really the president. Where really the point of what I was saying is, you can't you can't take what happened on January sixth. Say that these people are oh they're crazy. You know we don't have election fraud. Uh, our election system is perfect. These people are just, you know, uh, th- these crazy insurrectionists. And then two weeks later, come out with an article that confirms all their beliefs, but still calls them crazy. That's hypocritical. And really, the culprit in this situation is Time Magazine. Look, even if you wanted to, even if you wanted to call it out for what it was, right? What what Time Magazine was essentially showing was uh, there were people in the background using targeted ads to basically sway people to vote in a in a particular direction. We saw that with Cambridge Analytica. That's exactly what Cambridge Analytica was doing with targeted ad and a bunch of psychographics uh, over Facebook. So they were basically doing that for Joe Biden instead of, instead of Trump for this time. That's that's the whole the whole article basically outlines that. But I'm not the one that is coming out and saying this. All I'm doing is pointing out the hypocrisy within Time magazine. So they gave me a warning and they deleted that video. I went to appeal it, explaining all of this stuff to them, and within 12 hours they declined my appeal, and and you know stuck this warning on my channel. Well, two days later, uh, maybe not. I think it was a day later, uh, the day after they <laughs> rejected my appeal, they deleted another video, which was a little, little hyperbolically titled "The Proof That America Is Not a Democracy," right? And and I basically go through. And talk about how, you know, we've been championing this notion of democracy in America, but we're really not. Constitutionally, we're like a representative democracy Mm -hmm. uh, at best. But if you look at the way our election system works, uh, and if you look at how our legislators legislate, they don't really legislate on behalf of the people. Uh, You have the Electoral College. You have these billionaire donations who, you know, the maximum is, I think, like $5,800 or $5,200, something like that. But my point is, if you if you can spend $5,200 on multiple candidates, you know, just like betting on every horse in the race, then, and <laughs> like, you're, that's not really the will of the people. Like, most average people can't shell out, you know, $5,200 to their favorite candidate or what have you. So, it's it's an oligarchical system, and I basically point out like a lot of people have said this. Like Lawrence Lessig has come out, and he did a presentation where he talked about it, right? So a lot of people have addressed it. But now that we w- the after the events of January sixth, the YouTube and Twitter and Facebook and all these social media organizations have really really taken that as an opportunity to get rid of voices that they don't really want on their platform. Um, so. Again, I tried to appeal the video, explaining what the video was about, explaining what I was trying to say in the video, uh, and to and I basically asked them. I was like, "What in the video do you guys have a problem with? What in the video uh, do you feel like is deceptive practices or spam?" Like, I'm not trying to sell anything. I'm mm-hmm. not telling people, you know, the, the the wrong date of the election or that you can vote by text or you know, uh, wrong information about polling stations. Right. Like I'm not, I'm not doing what the Republican party does <laughs> on a pretty regular basis. And I got nothing back. And it, and then 45 minutes later, they rejected my appeal, continued this strike on my channel. Um, and you know, Lee, like Lee camp talked about it. And I just went and messaged a few folks to be like, Hey, 
keep an eye out for this because it seems like this is sort of the next step. Like we went from total demonetization of a lot of these larger channels and now they're just starting to delete videos uh, and put strikes on channels. And what I was primarily concerned about was this happened within a span of 48 hours. Uh, on, on Sunday afternoon, I get my warning. By Tuesday evening, I have a strike on my channel and I can't do anything on my channel for a week. If I get another strike, I can't do anything for two weeks and, and the third strike is is it. They'll delete your channel. Um, and I think an independent journalist that t talks a lot about the Syrian war and what's going on in Syria did have her channel deleted uh, very recently. And right after I got my channel uh, a strike on my channel we saw the consortium news got a strike on their channel uh, Randy Credico who is uh, someone that has talked a lot about Julian Assange and the work that he has done and and has been a, a positive advocate for him he got a strike on his channel and couldn't upload content or or live stream or anything uh, and then Hardlands Media which is an independent media uh, journalist company from uh, Chicago they got a strike on their channel for a video literally titled Joe Biden is the president. Joe Biden won the election or something along those. Like it's literally saying exactly what they want you to say. And they still put a strike on the channel because what they're going by based on what the what they say on their community stand. Uh, yeah. Community standards or whatever they have is <laughs> it's it's literally if you are denying that Joe Biden is the president. If you are selling false information about the election system, which again, yeah, I was going to ask, like, how yeah. opaque are these rules that people have to follow? Because it, it would affect, you know, the type of content that's being created. Yeah. People are going to that people are going to be catering to the algorithm like you were, you know, when you when you get this video, that's a hit and suddenly you have a bunch of new subscribers and then the algorithm stops recommending you. People are always going to be catering to that, but also people are going to be catering to these rules so that they can avoid censorship. How opaque are the guidelines? And yeah, yeah. they're not yeah. very clear. They're not very clear at all. Um, they kind of it's based on keywords, uh, titles, descriptions, and meta tags. So they're not actually <clears throat> looking at what's in the video. Do you get the impression that AI is doing the first the first sweep of these videos? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't think there's really a person like reviewing the content that uh, that's in these videos, um, which which also you think humans against... come in during the, the appeal process only. I don't even think they're coming in through the appeal process. I would have said that uh, initially, but I mean, the second appeal that I put in got denied in 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. And when uh, it's the same thing with like Consortium News and Randy Critico is like they tried to contact YouTube, but the only way you can contact them is when you appeal them and when you when you dispute what they the, you know, the strike that they put on there, like larger channels like a, like Jimmy Dore, for example, has somebody that he can go talk to. But if you're, you know, if you're not getting a million views on your videos on a regular basis, they mm -hmm. don't really care. Like you're you're too small and you're not generating enough ad revenue for them i guess for them to really care about you and my channel because of the way that it's been throttled over the over the years where every time there's a big bump in my subscriber count they they immediately put the kibosh on my channel i'm not at a point where i can be monetized so they kind of hit me in a different way which was which was every time the subscriber count goes up they they stop recommending my channel um, they stop sending notifications to, to my subscribers. So then, you know, like people that kind of regularly try to watch my stuff think that I'm an inactive channel. Uh, so they unsubscribe from me. So then I start losing subscriber counts. And when you say stopping, uh, notifications, does that mean even if your subscribers have clicked the bell and requested notifications, they won't get them? Yeah. And I've noticed that too, is I, I sometimes don't get notification from Lee Camp's channel or mm -hmm. Ron's channel. You know, like, and then randomly when I'm just kind of like sitting and, you know, d going over some emails or whatever, and I'll have a video in the background, I'll go, oh, oh, what's, I haven't really seen a video pop up on my feed from, from Ron or Lee or Graham or so on and so, whoever it is, and I have to go seek them out. Well, I'm the type of person that's going to do that anyway, because I, I enjoy listening to content <laughs> like this, but let's say you're not, and, and you do depend on what YouTube recommends you know, hey, these are your these are the channels you've subscribed to. Here are some new videos they've put up. 
what I was finding out was there were people that were like, oh, I had no idea that you were putting up new content. So I just unsubscribed from your channel because I just thought it was an inactive channel. And then eventually they'd resubscribe. And the other thing that was going on too that, I, uh, that other content creators were talking about was YouTube and Facebook would just unsubscribe people off of their off of their channels randomly. Um, so that was a way that they were kind of censoring people. Is Have they ever spoken about that? Like, oh, sorry, it was a glitch or is that just silence? They just don't address it. You know, that it's sort of the way that the algorithm, it, it's another thing that the algorithm uh, <laughs> does that no one really understands why it does or, or what it does. Um, and, and going back to the appeal process, like you said, like you, you want to have an actual person uh, that you can talk to to say, hey, please review the video. Like, go ahead mm -hmm. and watch the video. Uh, and maybe you can point out, like, at four minutes and 38 seconds, that's when you say this thing that's very controversial. And that's why we're going to take your video down because it's misinformation. And, and this is going against our community standards. But they never do any of that sort of stuff. And during my second appeal, I very specifically asked them that. Um, and Consortium News also very specifically asked them that. And now Hardlands Media does have kind of a, a, a happy ending, uh, as it were, because they, they got their video instated. They got the strike taken off their channel. Uh, and that was because, like, a bunch of their fans, a bunch of content creators got together, and they basically, I, like, went after YouTube on Twitter, on Facebook, and uh, all of their social media channels and stuff. And they were basically like, hey, you guys you guys messed up. You guys did something wrong. And they listened and they overturned it. Now, obviously, they haven't done that for anybody else because this one this one in particular was, was a major embarrassment to them because the video was literally titled Joe Biden is the President. <laughs> you know, like it has the thing that you want people to hear. And, and they were basically saying like, look – is is our election system perfect? Absolutely not. But this guy has now been elected as president, and what happened on January 6th was not okay, right? That was basically mm -hmm. the gist of the video. Uh, so that, that, I think, was a major embarrassment to YouTube, and I don't think they were expecting as much pushback. But have they done that for any of the other channels, right? Like, I'm, I'm a pretty small channel. Um, and I know like Randy Critico is much larger than mine. Uh, Consortium News is much larger than mine. Uh, and I have to wonder like how many other channels have been hit like ours has mm -hmm. that just don't have connections to larger content creators and larger journalistic out outlets to kind of stir things up, to kind of push back against YouTube. Uh, and I, I'm, very, I'm, I'm, a, I was a little nervous, honestly, because because my first two strikes came in a matter of two days. I was genuinely concerned that by the end of the week I was going to get a second strike, and by the end of the month I was going to get my third strike, and they would just delete my channel. Mm -hmm. And that concern still exists uh, because the way those strike work, the those strikes work is they stay on your channel for three months. So you have a three-month wi window where you have to prove that you can be a good content creator and not stir the pot for YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, and and essentially, like, if you get two strikes within those... two more strikes within those three months, your channel is done. Um, yeah, so it's kind of, it's pretty scary. One thing that I'd like to understand a little bit better is the context in which things like war coverage are getting censored because to me that seems somewhat political or on, on a national level seems somewhat political. If there is content that is calling out uh, misconduct, misconduct by the United States military, for example, it seems to get censored on the platform. And it's hard for me to take that in a way that isn't politically motivated. In, in, a, yeah. in a certain way by by YouTube and in you know in defense of um, the United States military for example and and it's clear to me also just seeing news clips from larger organizations like an MSNBC or CNN that pro-war coverage doesn't really face any any form of censorship right. they can celebrate uh, the the bombing of, of, of other countries all they want and it seems like that content flows freely especially from larger entities and it and it also looks to me like once there is 
criticism, you know, mounted against something like the United States military, uh, especially uh, over misconduct and war crimes and things like that. It seems to get censored quite quickly. Can you tell me a little bit about some of the content creators that you've seen? You said there was a someone that was covering Syria that had their entire channel deleted, yeah? Yeah, I, I just recently found out about that, uh, th that somebody posted about that on... Um on Twitter and, and from what I gathered that she was somebody that talks about Syria quite often mm -hmm. and uh, and she got two strikes on her uh, or three strikes on her channel within within that three month period and then the channel's gone you know and um, you know it it you're you're absolutely right it, when whenever Fox News or CNN they talk about oh you know Trump bombed Syria so now he's finally presidential like that sort of stuff is no problem but if you come out and talk about you know what what actually is going on in Syria and what the 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 true costs of war is and why we're not taking care of veterans um, and how this is a war for oil and and all that sort of stuff, you have to be really really careful uh, about getting past that first gatekeeper, which is the algorithm, right? So so you have to censor yourself a little bit because you can't title the video like oh Syria is a war for oil. It, because if you title it that way, the algorithm's going to pick it up and it's going to it's going to flag your your content or it's going to say, oh, you're you're going against our community guidelines uh, or, or you know, an anti-war video gets called uh, a video calling for violence or something like that. So, I, I, I mean, I remember during the Obama administration specifically, like I would I would see content creators have to get very creative in the way they title their videos. Mm -hmm. Uh, because if the word Syria or Saudi Arabia or Middle East or something like that was in the title, then that is a very easy way for YouTube to, or the YouTube algorithm rather, to kind of target that video and go, okay, we're going to show it to 10% of your audience and that's it. So if your channel normally on, on a video that you drop gets... 10,000 views all of a sudden now is only getting a thousand views kind of seems a little odd kind of seems a little strange so content creators were noticing some stuff, stuff like that and I was noticing stuff like that and I and I remember talking to a few people and they were just like yeah this is the only way we can get our video to not new audiences but just our audiences themselves and it <clears throat> and it feels like this is this is like the digital way of um of using like something like the Espionage Act or the Sedition Act, yeah. right? From like way back in the early 1900s, and those two pieces of legislation were specifically built to stop the anti-war movement and to stop socialists from calling out the the American military um, and calling out American war crimes. Uh, you know, like Eugene Debs, for example, was put into prison because he gave an anti-war speech, and under the Sedition Act, because he was criticizing the military and criticizing how uh, America was dealing with its foreign policy, he got sent to prison for five years. Uh, he ran for president from prison and got a million votes, but you know, but but that's the thing is is this is just a digital way of doing that. Mm -hmm. It's it's become far more difficult for um, for these agencies to say, oh well, you're going to go to prison for criticizing the American military, specifically because the Sedition Act was overturned. <laughs> like the judges were like, this is too crazy. Uh, but now it's you can you can have private companies like YouTube and Facebook and Twitter basically line up with specific politicians and say, oh, well, we're pri we're a private company and this is not the type of stuff that we want on our platform. And then when you go, well, what do you want on your platform? They go, no, 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 but we're not we're not going to dictate what people should or shouldn't say on our platform, but we are going to limit how many people see, you know, um, content about Julian Assange, content about uh, American war crimes in the Middle East, content about, you know, the JFK assassinations or what, whatever the topic, the, the, the controversial topic might be. Even though, to me, being anti-war is not <laughs> as yeah. complicated uh, as, as you know, politicians and, and corporate media would, would make it out to be. This is stuff that I think should be discussed on a pretty regular basis. And if it is discussed on a pretty regular basis, like it'll it'll just make our society a little bit smarter, 
a little bit more open-minded maybe think about things from a compassionate lens instead of a instead of a profit-driven lens you know like i i mean I, i've had discussions with people that are like oh you know i think the real major problem is it's a misuse of our money uh and you know uh, we're, we're, we're sending all these troops over there and we don't know what's going on it'll just be better when we can just use drones all the time so you know and it's like that's not really an anti-war stance right mm-hmm. like that's not really uh, that's that's not really <laughs> pushing back against the military industrial complex all you're saying is well uh i i, I think skynet should be invented a lot quicker <laughs> and make it like twice as violent as it was in terminator 2 <laughs> like if we can do that then i'm fine with warfare <laughs> like but those are the art those, those are the discussions that are okay to have uh, within the sphere of like corporate media and within the sphere of this this corporate technocracy that we live in, but to come out and say like, if you're gonna send people to war, you should when they come back home, you should take care of them, or maybe we should spend less on the military and have a defense military like the rest of the world has, or I don't know when you're in the middle of a global pandemic to call for an armistice, <laughs> so mm-hmm. you're not you're not building new military bases on the Iraq Iran border or in northern Syria instead you try to use the budget that you normally would use for the military to like fund things like Medicare for all or <laughs> or or like an infrastructure to deliver vaccines to people or 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 whatever it is to help this public health crisis that we that we're seeing but those narratives are seemed too controversial um and too difficult like the, like it's really really difficult to have those conversations uh especially when you know, YouTube and Facebook and things like that will immediately censor those conversations. Something that I've read early on, um, at like the, around the beginning of what what became the ad apocalypse, was a running theory that a lot of it was based on advertisers expressing a desire to not have their advertisements, you know, run before something that's like about war coverage at all so that that there's this like well first of all that there's this motivation that's just completely based on trying to get people to buy stuff um rather than it, it even being like specifically political but there's also this 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 desire it seems from advertisers of like oh that stuff's a bummer we need to be a apolitical and just not like I don't want to run a Pepsi ad before something about uh, you know an atrocity that was committed by the U.S. military. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, that part of it I find extremely frustrating. That it may be much more cynical than we even think. That it's not some national security conspiracy, but it is more about ad dollars uh than than about than about the the politics of it um that part of it is a huge bummer to me yeah you know and and that's that's kind of funny to me too is because i i have seen a lot of like advertisers and these major corporations take this very apolitical and neutral stance of like oh well obviously we don't support uh the the death of people blah 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 but then they'll they'll go and they'll see a movement right like if there's a huge movement taking place they'll co-opt that to try to sell their product right we saw that with pepsi a couple years ago yeah. where they use kendall jenner <laughs> to sell pepsi at a black lives matter rally or something which is like for for a company that is going to try to stay apolitical why are you clearly taking why are you clearly using a political movement um or a social movement to sell your shit like you know, and they and they did the same thing with uh, Colin Kaepernick, right? Colin Kaepernick had to do Nike ads, especially after he was dropped by the the NFL. He had to go and do Nike ads, uh, where they talked about you know overcoming challenges and and you know like they talked about civil rights and things of that sort. And the hypocrisy in that is you can't use a, a movement that you know can be traced back to. Uh, abolition and anti-slavery but still use slave labor across the seas to mm-hmm. build your shoes like that's the hypocrite the, the hypocritical thing same thing with Gillette right Gillette was trying to call out um, uh, like uh, b- bad behaviors in men I, I'm, 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 misogyny they were trying to call out misogyny in their commercials um, 
and and again it's like the the message is is good those are those are things that i think we should all be talking about but you're using that message to sell razors and meanwhile you know you're talking about equality between men and women but the same razor that you sell for for men is two or three times more expensive for women right uh, or or your corporate culture hasn't really changed in terms of treating women uh, any better R right like are you offering maternity leave now are you offering like two years maternity leave where where you know the, your your female employees are taken care of so that they can stay at home and take care of their uh, their families are you offering paternity leave now right like are you offering six months maternity leave six months paternity leave uh, and helping with the cost of daycare helping with the cost of of, of raising a child right are you going to treat your employees better by offering them a, a livable wage not a minimum wage a livable wage but you don't see any of that sort of stuff because really what those advertisings become is they become fluff and they're using a political movement and they're mm -hmm. using political ideologies to sell the product so so now the political ideology itself has become a product that they can that they can sell so I always find it kind of funny when when things like the apocalypse happen and they go, oh, well, you know, the Nissan Corporation is apolitical and we stand with everybody regardless of who you are and what you believe in. So we really don't want to be <laughs> put in front of uh, an anti-war thing or a right wing uh, pro gun uh, video or something like that. And, and it, I think it comes down to asking the question, which is, do you like should YouTube have advertisers and if they do have advertisers should they control uh what kind of content gets propped up on youtube as it were right like that's the that's the question i think we should be asking because if the advertisers are saying oh we're apolitical but we have no problem using a political movement to sell our products but we don't want to be associated with a video about uh, you know, war crimes in Syria because it's a bummer and it goes against our brand messaging or whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, now you're controlling, now these advertisers are controlling what exists on your platform. So really then your platform doesn't become about sharing content uh, and sharing thought and a place where people can engage in reasonable critical thinking, but, but rather a place where it's, uh, you know, it's commercials with some thought-provoking content at the end, right? Like it's it, it, it's it's like trans like the movie Transformers trying to make a social message, but the whole movie's a freaking commercial for Mountain Dew and Pepto Bismol and and Chevy and all. So there, so you can't <laughs> really. Well, it fully it. reshuffles the incentive structure of these platforms to exactly. go from something that could you know foster good journalistic content, information. Um, and, and it creates a platform that really incentivizes um, entertainment and uh, entertainment that is like eye catching and distracting at that. It, it doesn't, it's not when you have these types of ecosystems for content, it doesn't foster good content. It, it, it fosters distracting content. It fosters yes. content that, that gets people, uh, that gets people to click on things that that, yeah. that messes with your emotions and um, really sort of pulls you along so that you're giving those those ad impressions. And I think asking about should should there even be advertisements on YouTube opens up a whole spectrum of discussion here where you have to consider if YouTube doesn't have advertisers, then uh, are they going to start charging users? that locks a lot of people out. That's not, that's not fair. And I think, you know, people have deserved to be able to access content, especially stuff that will be informative about um, their own communities and their own lives and help them with things. But at the same time with advertisers inside of that ecosystem, it really opens up the whole system to manipulation. Um, and this brings me to one of my points, which is, it seems to me that a uh, fairly elegant solution to a lot of this is going re rewinding the clock a bit and going back to chronological feeds. This is something, it's not a very like popular idea. Uh, and, and a lot of people have much more complicated and systematic approaches to this, but I really think seeing a chronological feed of the content that you're already subscribed to 
removes the algorithmic algorithmic manipulation. People are going to see your content as it comes out. And it actually mirrors, uh, and I, I was thinking about this before the podcast started today, but it sort of mirrors the system that already exists for podcasts. And I think is why podcasts are so often looked at as like more controversial media than stuff like Facebook and YouTube and things like that. Because for folks that don't know, podcasting is based on an internet protocol called RSS and anyone can publish an RSS feed. You can, and there, there are apps like Apple podcasts and Spotify that index these things. But if you want, you can write your own podcast app. You can use open source podcast apps. And it is actually impossible at the moment to censor podcast content. Um, and this leads into another point of mine, but podcasts are sort of a proof of concept of a form of decentralized social media. They're, they're running on an internet protocol. You can host them yourself. My organization, for example, hosts our own podcasts and we wrote our own RSS feed um, that we can give to the different platforms. But if you want, we have it in the description. You can just hook the RSS feed into whatever podcasting app that you want. There are plenty of open source ones on iOS and Android and no one can stop us from publishing. We're hosting it ourselves. So it makes me wonder, you know, what the future holds for social media um, in regards to things that sort of mirror the 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 like the good features of RSS, where you're posting content to a more more of a protocol than a platform, and you know people are able to build shells around that that allow you to view your content however you want. It seems to me like the the real problem is advertiser dollars dictating content. Um, and also just the algorithmic uh, manipulation that goes on within these con within these uh, platforms that is designed to, um, you know, generate as much ad revenue as possible in a way that they don't even understand. Um, a lot of these systems are a black box, as many people know, and and they're just indexing and organizing the content in ways that the uh, developers of these, uh, you know, platforms don't fully understand. And then you run into these weird situations where somebody with a video title that is Joe Biden is the president gets flagged as controversial. Um, and <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering like you, you, so we have a podcast that you'll be publishing in, in I think two weeks that we recorded yes. the other day. Mm -hmm. And in that we discussed um, Rockfin, which is a decentralized platform that you've been publishing on. Can you describe that to me a little bit and, and how you're using it and, and what kind of advantages Rockfin provides compared to something like YouTube. Yeah. Um, so they're, uh, they're, they're like a blockchain crypto, uh, site. They have, um, these things called Ray tokens. Um, so, so really it's, it's this video platform site built around cryptocurrency, uh, which I think is really interesting and i'm and i'm not like a super big crypto expert as i mentioned yesterday when we were recording does uh, it allow tipping and stuff like that oh yeah, yeah yeah so you can like you can tip uh there's no minimum subscribers you need like for youtube you need a thousand subscribers in order to be able to get super chats or be monetized mm -hmm. period right and and like i've talked to ron placone about this uh a, a multiple times uh because you know we'll we'll get together or over zoom or just over a phone call and he'll be like, yeah, my channel got demonetized again. Or or it's like a video that he puts up about a particular piece of legislation um, on, a, you know, Monday, March 15th. And by Tuesday, March 16th, the video is demonetized, right? So then he appeals it. And by March 25th, the video videos, uh, has been appealed and has been remonetized. Well, the video got 280,000 views. Uh, and now he can't monetize any of those 280,000 views because the monetization only kicks in. So, But there's none of those things on Rockfin. Um, the way Rockfin works is there there's a bunch of free content and then there's premium content. So they work on that freemium model, right? And f if you pay like $9.99 or 10, 10 bucks a month, you get not just premium content from the channel that you endorse, right? Like if people want to find my channel on Rockfin and they decide to endorse it, which by the way, it's rockfin.com slash Krishmohanhaha to 
throw a little plug in there. Uh, but if you endorse my channel, you get everybody's premium content. So now you you get to earn a little bit more because you brought in active subscribers, uh, but you get a little bit more because more people are watching your channel, more people are sharing your channel, they're interacting with your channel a little bit more. So you, you earn an income based on just how people are watching your channel, just for you to put up content that people want to see. And then on top of that, people can tip. On top of that, people can become like uh, like subscribers, right? It, it, and, it, and it's kind of like the Netflix for content creators is sort of how it's working, but they pay you better than Netflix. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and I, you know, I've talked to a few people and it's like, if you get five or six people that are active subscribers on your channel, you can make enough money to earn a living uh, just off of posting content and live streaming on, on Rockfin. It's really an incredible platform, and they do exactly what you're talking about. When I go on Rockfin, uh, you know, they, they'll throw up a couple recommended videos like, hey, you know, you, you watch uh, Richard Methurst's video the other day. Here's something he posted a, a couple days ago. Here's something that Ron posted a few hours ago. You know, here's something that Lee posted whoever it is so there so there's a section for that so if you're somebody that's a fan of you know youtube being like hey i i noticed you watched xyz here's some videos that you might also like well they have that feature but below that is is exactly what you're talking about it's it's a video uh, it's it's a bunch of videos and it's based on chronological order but that doesn't mean that if i don't want to you know if i see a video of graham's titled like oh Let's talk about the cognitive decline of Joe Biden or something like that. I'll go, oh, I'll watch that. And then it's the same thing as YouTube is I'll go, oh, that was interesting. I wonder what else Graham has on his channel. Click on Graham's channel and you go and see a bunch of different stuff. So there's really no censorship on there. You, it, It's welcome to everybody. It's welcome to all spans of thought. And, and it does have all spans of thought. There's people that I watch on Rockfin and I go, you know, I don't really agree with what you have to say, but I'm still glad that you're on the platform. I'm still mm -hmm. glad you get to express your thoughts because really what Rockfin does and what I think YouTube and Facebook don't is encourage critical thought. I think it's really important for people to to look at something or listen to something and go, well, I disagree with that. Mm -hmm. But why do I disagree with that? You know, and then start forming your your beliefs or say, I, I do believe in that, but why do I believe in that? Why is this ringing true with me? Is it because of my per and and the content that that kind of you know makes people think a little bit, and that's good. And Rockfin is promoting that because I'll listen to some stuff and I go, mm, this doesn't really gel with what I think, but maybe I'm wrong, right? Maybe maybe I don't have the facts. Maybe I don't have the experiences this person does. So let me listen to it a little bit more. I do that more often on Rockfin than I do on YouTube because on YouTube, if, if I disagree with somebody and I click a down vote, well, I'll, ne I'll probably never see that person again. Mm -hmm. But with Rockfin, I'm more encouraged to dig in and, 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 and like look at the information a little further and go, yeah, you know, I, I really don't think that this person has uh, the right opinion or, or I feel like their facts are a little bit skewed. So I might... I might distance myself from them a little bit. I might not view their content as much. And that's okay, right? Because you, not everybody is for everybody. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? And, or what it also promotes, and then this is something I've seen in alternative media like Minds.com and Rockfin and Mastodon and things, is there are people that will comment and they'll disagree with you, but it's never, oh, you're a horrible person and I'm going to report you to YouTube so that your channel, there's no vitriol because that vitriol isn't particularly rewarded on these platforms. What is rewarded on the platforms is genuine discussion. So I've had people that have come out and been like, I disagree with your point of view on economics and here's why. And I go, well, that's a great perspective. Thank you for sharing that with me, but here's why I disagree with that. And I've had more genuine conversations on these platforms than I do on YouTube, you know, because mm -hmm. I think YouTube and Facebook kind of um, they thrive on that sort of di that that vitriol and that fighting like it keeps people on that platform. Uh, and and I was talking a little bit about with with Dayton about like how really hate fuels a lot of what we do. <laughs> you and, know? and for people who might be too young to have a memory of this, like. 
around like two before 2010 2011 i swear the internet was kind of like this like there all the feeds were chronological there was a lot more cross pollination and discussion and everyone was so much calmer and it was yeah. so nice yeah. <laughs> like I, you would open instagram and it really would just be the things that people posted in the order that they posted them and you know there were sites like reddit and stuff that were doing some form of, of uh, like secret algorithmic manipulation but the vast majority of the internet was chronological there was a lot more discussion and everyone was way chiller <laughs> well i even remember like when i was in in middle school and stuff you know when you're a, a teenager and you're hormonal like your opinions are always at tuned up to an 11 mm -hmm. like I'm a, I'm a big anime nerd so i would go on these chat rooms <laughs> and talk about anime with random strangers and we would have you know differences on who our favorite characters were in cowboy bebop or gundam wing or whatever and then we would make our arguments to each other uh and it was never it was it, it never went to the point of well you have this opinion it's different from mine so you're a piece of shit and i'm gonna block you forever right like it was always kind of respectful yeah we would get heated i mean if you're gonna have differences of opinions there's a chance that things are gonna get a little heated but it was never to the point where they wanted to like you know oh you're you're never welcome back in this chat room ever again <laughs> whereas now i kind of feel like you know in facebook groups like i i have gotten um removed from several facebook groups that like were very excited that i was posting my content and engaging with people in the group mm -hmm. um and you know i posted something about uh this is back in november when uh the indian farmer strike started and it was against these neoliberal economic policies that were really going to let like corporate um uh, corporate agribusiness companies like Mons Bayer Monsanto to come in and essentially the the end result would be that these farms that these small mm -hmm. family farmers have built their whole lives around would get bought out and they would be left with nothing so farmers realized that and they pushed back against it. it was the largest strike in human history 250 million people went on a general strike in, in one day on Thanksgiving last year so I covered it because I didn't see any corporate media covering it. Uh, you know, it was like me, <laughs> like a couple of like the gray zone, uh, Lee camp, Jimmy Dore, Graham Elwood. So it's like four comedians and in an independent news organization. were covering the largest strike in human history. And I posted this video in a Facebook group. And of course, nobody, there were a few people that were like, this is cool. Thanks for letting us know. But the primary sort like comment that got the most attention was a comment calling me Russian propaganda. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that oh, it's it's this it's this Russian movement that is that has co-opted the farmers in in India, and this guy's a this guy's clearly a Russian plant. And it went back and forth, and they contacted the mods, and they contacted the uh, the the administrator of the group. And then the following week, you know, it, without any notice, without any kind of conversation with me, I was removed from the group, and it really sucked because. What was fun about that group was uh, people were engaging with my content. You know, there were people that were talking to me and they go, hey, what about this? What about this? Have you talked about this before? Uh, what are your thoughts and opinions on this? Do you have a video about this? So it was starting to become. And do you get the feel that you were censored on Facebook in particular for that post because they were trying to like stifle like like foreign propaganda? I, yeah, like, well, I don't think it was. I don't think it was Facebook necessarily, but okay. the people that kind of believe that narrative, which yeah. has been promoted by Facebook and YouTube, right? The whole like McCarthyist narrative of, mm -hmm. oh, the Russians are coming, and anything that goes against this American capitalism must be Russian influenced. Like, so people kind of believe that stuff. That stuff is okay to put on your platform, but talking about the largest strike in human history, apparently, is not. Um, you know, and and but to go but go back to the comparison with the chat room, I felt like those groups were starting to become like those those chat rooms that I was in when I was a teenager, and then it just takes like one or two people that have been propagandized by uh, by Facebook algorithm kind of manipulating people, right? They they only show you things that you're gonna be in conflict with. Um, 
you know, so they kind of show you like, oh, here's Rachel Maddow talking about the Russians. So if you see any content like this, call, you know, it's Russian and you got to report them and they go against community standards. And and I think that's kind of what happened. Like people were encouraged to censor other people because their opinions were different. Um, and, and, you know, like talking about a strike becomes Russian propaganda. It's, it's, it's just kind of crazy. Whereas before... I think if we still kind of had like the chat room mentality <laughs> when we were teenagers, that might not be the case. Maybe it would have been more encouraging to say, I don't, you know, th this, this seems kind of shady to me. Here's, you know, here's what I think is going on and you're reporting it from this perspective. W w where are you coming from? Can you clarify or something like that? Have you ever used Discord? I have. I don't really know how to use it too often. I use, I've, I've it's used it kind of like what you're describing with the anime, you know, chat rooms and stuff where it, it really it's a it's totally a social network. There are many, many millions of discord chats that you can join. You have one account you can go through and join all of them. And then you can direct message people right inside of the platform. And it's by nature, by necessity, sort of a chronological chat. And it oh, is. Cool. Well, to an extent, much more chill. We we um, actually ran one for a number of months at Fight for the Future around the um, Blizzard Hong Kong situation, um, and I, it was it was a pleasure to run. Of course, there were some people that came in and tried to cause trouble, but it wasn't insurmountable to moderate that and also have like and foster good discussion wow. and discord of, of of the social networks right now is truly like a, a pleasure to use um because of the reasons that we've been highlighting like social networks should 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 try to like move towards yeah i need to i need to learn how to use it uh the only time i've used it is uh, a friend of mine runs a D and D game, and I was mm -hmm. like a guest on his D and D game, so I've only used it for that purposes. But I liked it. I did, and and it was one of those things where I was like, ah, if I had like five more hours in my week, I could dedicate a little bit of time to like learn how to use Discord properly and figure out how to. Um, th and this is a little bit of a tangent. Uh, it, it, that's something that I've been kind of trying to think of is. I, I'm, I'm trying to like build up the sustaining memberships like the Patreons and things of that sort uh, and I'm trying to figure out like what can I do to make this something special for people uh, to, to and, and be more engaging with those folks uh, who have dedicated not just their time but also their financial resources into the 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 things that I'm creating, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's this this is a lot of me. A lot of this is talking about things that I'm super excited to talk about, um, and and sharing like knowledge and information that I've uh, learned about over the course of the of of the last few years. Um, and how do I share that with people who are investing in me sitting in my room, learning about social movements and then uh, yelling about it into a camera, right? Like <laughs> and swearing at them for for money essentially, which is really all what standup is, uh, is the, it's, it's a, a, a person who has decided to, to swear at you in a bar or in a theater, uh, with a cover charge is <laughs> if you boil it down, but like, there's people that have invested in that and I want to do something cool for them. And, and a couple people have suggested, like, you can use discord as a way to, uh, to, to really build that up and to really build like a communal aspect behind it. So mm -hmm. I, I should. I should really start learning how to use Discord and and how I can use it as a way to kind of build community around topics that I might not have time to, you know, record over a podcast or something. Yeah, you totally should. Discord is a lovely little platform for sure. Um, so I think we're going to probably wind down in just a sec, but could cool. you um, could you let folks know where they can find your content um, out on the internet? Yeah, uh, everything. I post uh, uh, all my videos and podcasts and uh, all my donation links and all my stand-up comedy albums uh, are available right on my website, which is krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. 
Uh, and like I said, uh, you can donate to, to what I do there. Uh, you can check out my stand-up comedy albums. Uh, pretty much every video that I put up on, on my uh, YouTube channel and on my Rockfin channel uh, wind up on, on my website. So it's kind of the one spot for all those things. Um, and then if you want to specifically join my Rockfin, it's rockfin.com slash krishmohanhaha. Uh, and uh, I, I usually post content there before it gets released on YouTube. So if you're looking for a place to get uh, videos earlier than everybody else <laughs> that's the place to go um and i'm also working on like generating more premium content um uh, for for rockfin and for the sustaining members as well so do you have a patreon or anything like that I know, I me you mentioned patrons yeah i do uh the patreon is patreon.com slash krishmo and haha uh which the link to that is uh available directly on my uh website as well uh, cool. the donate page yep <laughs> well so. thank you uh very much for joining um it was a super interesting discussion i always love you know discussing algorithmic amplification and and the platforms and stuff so really good discussion thank you yeah, very much thank you. this was really fun i really appreciate you guys having me on this was great yeah I think we should do it again. <laughs> if you uh, like content like this, make sure to subscribe to the channel, click the bell uh, for notifications. And if you liked this video, like the video, um, because it really does help um, with this exact problem that we're talking about with algorithmic amplification. So help us fight it and uh, like the video if you liked it. We are on Apple Podcasts and Spotify as well. So if you prefer uh, the audio only version, if you want to listen to it while you're doing stuff or driving around or, or while you're working, that is the place to go. We are uh, there as well. Um, and we do this every week on Friday at one o'clock Eastern, uh, 10 a.m. Pacific. So, um, you know, check, check back for the channel. I, I try to post the, uh, the videos before they're going live, give, give people a few days to set reminders for it. So, so check there and, um, thank you for joining us this week. It was episode six. And again, thank you very much, Chris, for joining it. It was a really, really good discussion. I, I, I appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. This was great. Cool. So we will see you all next week. Uh, take care and uh, have a nice weekend.